We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Now, the best way is for questions to come through our website or joining us live on Twitch where you can just send your questions directly. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Tonight's topic comes from patron of the show and local Windsor game designer, Roger Malash, who writes, Hey Mo, I'm still enjoying and learning a lot from your podcasts. I recently came up with a dice game called Euchre Dice. I pretty much learned to count playing games like Euchre and Crazy Eights, so I thought Euchre Dice would be a game that everyone could enjoy. Mm -hmm. I started to play test the game, and I couldn't find any players who were familiar with Euchre, and a very few who were familiar with trick-taking games in general. Oh. Growing up, I remember seeing at least one, if not a few, Euchre games going on in high school and college cafeterias mm -hmm. at any given time, as well as parties at work, family get-togethers. I was surprised to see how few hobby gamers had played games like these. There seems to be some sort of cultural divide between today's hobby gamer and traditional games like Euchre. Is this just a local phenomena, or is this there some type of cultural divide that needs to be bridged? Well, thanks for the very detailed question, Roger. Um, so what I thought we'd do with Roger's question here is we're going to start off with an open discussion between Sean and I, as well as the chat, on the popular of traditional card games right now in 2020. Um, a lot of that, I'm hoping we can get some feedback from the chat room, since Sean and I are pretty much the same age and would have had similar experiences, especially going to schools in Windsor, right? We're both from Windsor. So hoping to get a little bit more feedback on that. From there, though, what I want to do is I want to move on to some game recommendations where we'll suggest some modern trick-taking games, hobby board games that we think are great and worth checking out. Yep. Now, to start off, how about we talk about our personal history? So your history, my history with trick-taking games. Now, like, was you went to a different high school than I did. We went, you went to a totally different university out of town. So was Euchre a thing like at the, in the Assumption lunchroom? Did you play cards with your parents growing up? What's your so, background with it? So Euchre, in high school, Euchre was definitely a thing yeah. in the cafeteria. Uh, and there was actually, I believe, even a Euchre club in the school mm. um, that did uh, their own sort of more competitive thing, aside right. from, you know, kids just throwing down a deck of cards. Um, while cribbage and other ca classic card games I did learn at home, Euchre, we, we were never a Euchre family at home. Uh, it was definitely a school thing. Um, then there was uh, a few other games. Uh, I don't even know the polite name for the one game that... Uh, President. Think, is that what it is? Um, yeah, that's one of the polite names. Okay. I, I only ever knew it as the, the name I can't say on our podcast. Yes. Um, <laughs> that we were played that for a, a lot until it was banned and everyone went back to Euchre. Um, but, uh, one thing I've noticed, uh, growing up, uh, both in your family, uh, my grandparents, and then again with Sherry's family in Welland, there seems to be a strong French Canadian mm -hmm. route to a lot of these card games. And I don't know if that's just my personal, uh, observational bias, or if it's a real thing that there, there is just this, uh, history of traditional card games in the French community. I, well, I've definitely seen that side of it myself with my parents coming from the French community, Canadian community, but also um, the biggest place is my parents used to be members of various uh, social clubs um, from church groups to Knights of Columbus to the Moose Lodge, the Legion, things like that. Um, yes, my dad did serve at one time. So and those, at least in Windsor, were primarily French Canadian members, especially the Knights of Columbus was a very strong French Canadian uh, club, at least locally. I, I actually don't know worldwide the knights of columbus are have a french canadian to tend to them or not but well, i think a lot gaming, of it is i think a lot of it is is um both the region uh but also yeah. um it's uh knights of columbus is, is a very catholic uh yes, group which and is also that does tend french to lead towards the, the french canadian side yes. of things fair enough but like that was it was huge like like to be honest there was always a deck of cards readily available at my house like my my mom and dad used to leave a deck out on their dining room table almost every place we went for dinner or to hang out was a place where there would be cards available uh, again the knights of columbus the legion stuff like that my my dad uh, also played a lot of um local sports and 
we go back to whatever sports bar, whatever the, the you'd support the venue, right? Like or the sponsor, you'd support the sponsor. You go play baseball, you go back. If you struck out, you buy a pitcher of beer and everyone's at our own place. It's like it just ubiquitous. Like there was, I, I grew up surrounded by people playing traditional card games. Now my parents did play Euchre, but mostly only for, like my dad refused to play Euchre for fun. He only played for money. So they would join leagues. They would join Euchre leagues and enter Euchre tournaments. For them though, the big game was crib. And that still is for both my parents were, 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 was cribbage. That was the game they liked the most. Now, high school, Euchre was huge. Just like Sean said, everyone was playing it. I'll admit I wasn't. I then I discovered role-playing games and other hobby board games. And I was more interested in sitting in a corner reading my Roma Chaos books during my lunch break. But it, it did seem like everyone else was playing it. University, you saw it. But the big thing that happened when we were in university, at least in Windsor, was the collectible card games hit. And those spread beyond just the gaming community. Like, like that got a lot of new people. And I saw more people playing Magic the Gathering than I saw playing Euchre or Poker or anything like that. Now, people did play traditional card games. But more often, I saw people playing Magic or some variant of a Jihad or whatever, Miskatonic or any of the other CCGs out at that time. But even then, people were starting to get distracted technology. Because the other big thing that happened was people moved from Magic onto Moos and Muds. And even Sean was part of that, too. And that was a big shift. Like, all of a sudden, all the people were sitting around playing Magic. We're now sitting in the computer science lab in this virtual world doing that instead. Which I think goes to what we're going to get some comments later from our uh, our Discord channel. And I think that kind of ties in a bit. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I, I I didn't, I, in the high school, I definitely didn't see the the shift while I was there to that digital uh, format. It was still very much uh card based in some form or other um right. and of course we weren't you know we didn't have cell phones uh <laughs> my, I didn't well, get yeah, my first no. cell phone until i was uh, almost graduating university but um it's uh it's interesting i think uh there's definitely some of the the Yu -Gi -Oh and the pokemon that sort of took over uh but right. then those got banned as well um like i know again this is a, a different in in the grade school going down to the grade school, but with my kids, uh, they were interested in doing the card thing and bringing the Pokemon. Mm -hmm. But then those were banned for various reasons because there were bad actors, you know, scamming kids for valuable cards that the kids just thought were cool. Mm -hmm. And those were all banned and nothing ever really seemed to replace it. Like there was no, no one ever wanted to play even, even something like Uno or something like that with right. the other kids from school. Um, those games still get played at home. Uh, we'll still play uh, play Uno and a few other card games with the kids, but there's never really been any interest that I've seen from the kids at school to continue that sort of uh, trend. Now, when they banned card games, did they ban all card games? Like, could you bring a deck of traditional playing cards? Or it was, I was all, it was only ever just uh, like like specific, specific games. games. You know, they banned Pokemon, and I believe they banned Yu Gi Oh. Um, yeah. And then it was See, all because of never... that trading. We played a couple times here and my kids never got into it. I don't know why. I mean, it was probably banned at their school before they <laughs> before they could really Quite do possibly. it. So jumping to modern times, I got to admit, I don't see it much now with gamers. Like, I don't think I've ever seen anyone break out a deck of cards at a WGR event. And I've been running WGR events since 2002. So in the last 18 years at public play gaming events, I don't see traditional card games, right? Like, like oh, I'll admit, I've seen decks of cards, but like we use them to draw prizes and use a deck of cards to do initiative in Savage Worlds and there's RPGs that use deck of cards. But like, I haven't seen a group sit down and play Euchre or Hearts or Spades or any of those ever. Like at, at the CG Realm at Ian's Hugin Immunin years ago, like it just never happened. Now for the next, the previous generation, my mom still plays cards. Like if it wasn't COVID right now, my mom would be at the Moose Lodge in West Windsor playing at her Euchre Club that she went to every Wednesday before we locked down. And I know where my dad lives um, in long-term care. They have regular card game nights, though sadly my dad's not able to take part, but they, they constantly, like there is definitely a generational, my parents played it more than we did. I play it less than they do. And my kids, we had to teach Gwen how to do a trick-taking game the other day. Right. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, because you've got uh, even classic kids games like uh, Old Maid and things, you know, mm -hmm. there are there are trick trick taking games out there for the kids. But even those 
I don't think are getting the same level of attention that they once did. Uh, interestingly, I just actually caught an article on line from Detroit in 2019 talking about how Euchre has dimmed, but is still being played in Ontario, the Midwest, and then Australia and New Zealand. Okay. Um, so I think sure. uh, a large amount of America may have never really done the Euchre thing. So maybe it is local. It, then. it does seem to be more of a Midwest, Ontario, sort of that, that, that central area uh, sort of thing. And again, I, I do think there are some family um, aspects to it. So then, like I would think, I never taught our kids how to play Crazy Eights. I think someone at one point taught them to play War, but it wasn't me. <laughs> I wouldn't have taught them to play War. Um, like also, like this is we were talking trick taking, but like I used to play Solitaire a lot, mm -hmm. and that's one I definitely think has been replaced by a phone. Well, Solitaire, I mean Windows, like Windows killed Solitaire. Right, Windows, yeah, Windows exactly. Ninety five from Windows ninety five on. Why would anyone yeah. play lay out a deck of cards when you can play Solitaire, especially the Solitaire they've got now in in the Windows yeah. ten version? It's an obnoxious See, thing I to throw ads it. at you. But uh, oh. once once you get away from the ads, it's actually got, you know, four or five different uh, variants. And it's it's a really fun way to play solitaire. All right. So you're talking about localization. I know we have someone from the desert down a little more south than the rest of us and they've in the chat room. Now, I haven't been watching the chat as quick. But Any they... experience with Euchre in that back then? Never heard of it is, the, is what Pennywise is saying. Never heard of... Euchre. What? <laughs> euchre? Wow. Yeah. So there you go. Never heard of Euchre. Wow. So yeah, I guess it there you go. Roger, here's here's one of your answers. It is localized. Um, I will admit, I, we didn't do any research before this. So you're getting a very biased, uh, narrow view here, though at least Sean went a little further up north. Um, we do have a lot of other people in the chat room. What do we got from the chat? I saw Cribbage is popular and so on. We got, thank you. I got to say, first off, thanks for the awesome amount of interaction. Like that is the the most number of stuff I've had to scroll back to in a long time <laughs> on our chat room. Yeah, apparently uh, Illinois, Indiana, Kentucky, Michigan, Ohio, and Pennsylvania are part of the Euchre Belt in the States. Okay. Uh, and Michigan is the buckle of the Euchre Belt. The Euchre Belt. <laughs> okay, what about like other like uh, hearts or spades or like other trick-making games? Yeah, I don't know. I, I suspect or it's poker. probably... Like, like well, poker's poker is pretty poker, Yeah, poker is a, a very big... Ubiquitous, right? Like yeah. poker is a trick-taking game. It's more of a gambling game, but it is definitely a trick-taking game. I don't know. Um, so Jeff Seuss is knowing it was only around my parents, aunt and uncle played Euchre. He personally avoided them until recently, which I think is awesome. I like, I love this one. I use decks of cards as a box of bookmarks. <laughs> That's pretty funny. I do remember a time, like when I was a kid, like we used to just play with cards, right? Like you had houses, things before you learned how to play. But again, they were everywhere. Yeah. Now tech again, I think is around our age group and from Windsor. So yes, he played all the time in high school. Uh, Pennywise's parents played hearts a lot. So there you go. Okay. So, so yeah, so hearts. it's not... Like I prefer personally, I'm, I'm not a big Euchre fan. I like Hearts and Spades are my my two favorite classic card games. I never got into Crib. I don't know. So reasons Jeff didn't dig them is they him and his friends felt that the games needed a theme, even if it's a, a thin one. To enjoy a game, you wanted to have a theme to it. And I will admit that is true. Like card, most card games are are pure abstracts. There is zero zip, not a no theme, which I think is one of the changes actually when we get into the modern trick taking games. Is they are all actually pretty heavily themed. A uh, wizard being one that's not which again, we're kind of spoiling some of the stuff we're going to talk about <laughs> later, but that's fine. Yeah. But like you look at games like, like the crew or whatever, like they're all theme, like, like you're using the mechanics to tell a story as opposed to spades, euchre, diamonds, clubs, um, and poker. Like what, what, to be honest, is there a story? I wonder if there is a story behind them. Yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, as far as I know, I mean, they're all basically gambling games, uh, without, right. you know, without, without, uh, money involved in most uh, family cases anyway. Like there's um, obviously a royal tie-in because you've got the, the queen, king, and jack, right? Like, whereas, you know, chess is supposed to be a war. I kind of wonder what a card game is supposed to represent. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah, Cribbage like... caught me to count to 15. Maybe that's my problem. <laughs> so Jeff noted that, um, that, that Yu-Gi-Oh! was, of course, big. So I, I do think collectible cards did replace playing cards to at least some extent yeah at least locally um jeff did note that the, that game president he also knew people that played 
Yeah, no, there's, it's interesting, like, because the problem, the, one of the problems with cards is they go back to, you know, prehistory, well, right? Well, forever, They're, I mean, right? yeah. the Egyptians, uh, you know, uh, the time of the pyramids were playing with decks of cards, uh, and, you know, whether or not it was a king or a queen or a you know, god or a pharaoh at the time, uh, right. it's, it's changed. So I suspect that, you know, one to ten is the easy number, and then you, you go whatever your uh, the special suit special special uh, higher yeah. higher values are above that I, I just it's like i know go is also supposed to represent the battle right and it's, right. it's surrounding your enemy and trying to control areas of the board just wondered uh roger's got an amusing one my mom can can't remember what she had for lunch but she kills still kick my butt in euchre um i will say that, that that was one of the things with my dad's declining health that man he was able to play cards for quite some time and may still even be able to honestly if you gave him a deck of cards and you just started playing he might be able to even pick it up but it was actually um his inability to play magic the gathering which was my first indicator that something was wrong that's actually what got me to have him go see a doctor is we were at a knights of columbus because that's what my dad and i did is we went to knights of columbus we drank cheap beer we played pool and we played games and i got i was we'd done it a bunch of times in a row i don't know if he was on vacation i was on shutdown whatever it was and I decided to grab, I was cleaning up and I found a sealed deck of Mirage and a sealed deck of um, whatever the one after that, the desert one. Uh, no, it was Ice Age and Mirage. Sorry, those two sets. And I'm like, oh my God, we have two sealed decks here. So I brought them thinking this will be hilarious. We'll each crack open a deck and just play Magic. And he wasn't able to play. And I'm like, wow, okay, that's not right, Dad. Like, And that's what finally got him to go get diagnosed when we found out that he had early stage Alzheimer's at the time. Right. Uh, there was marbles. People noticed that. People yep. played marbles and marbles, pogs. pogs. That's the other one. Yep. So um, Euchre is biggest in Canada with a little bit in a very few states. So even in Canada, it's mostly Ontario. So that there we have found the answer to your question as far as I can tell, assuming that our chat room smarter than we are. <laughs> uh, interestingly, I'm just sort of scanning through some quickly, some, uh, some Vegas-based news on the history of cards. Uh, and initially, the, uh, the different... Uh, royalty were very specific people. Um, okay. And so like the king of cards was for periods of time known as this person and right, the right. queen of hearts was this person. Uh, and so there was that, but that wasn't so much still, that was still more the theming of the deck as opposed right. to the game. Um, mm -hmm. The game, the games were something you did with the fun decks, but um, doesn't, uh, doesn't really seem to, to, have that theme behind the games as much right. as you know war obviously i mean it's, you know, mm. that's about as, as themed as you get i guess yeah i just kind of wonder it's interesting so uh tech did play some gin and rummy that was popular those aren't trick taking but um a theme can get in the way of a good trick taking game is roger's view so there we have the abstract gamer versus the uh story gamers both yep. with different views which is great because that's why there are multiple games on the market not every game is for everyone um Played rummy from time to time with their dad. That's Pennywise. Um, uh, Domino's is, is, is and I, I would actually be interested to know um, if Domino's was something that got played in schools in some regions, because I know there's a oh, lot yeah, of definitely. like Domino's can be one of those hardcore games, but also well, that's a, gambling. Pennywise is saying Domino's is king down there. But, so. but, but Domino's is also one of those games that often involves a lot of betting and is one of those things that yeah. schools may try to dissuade people from playing because of those betting connections. Yeah, you don't see dominoes up here. Like it no. exists, but yeah. A few people my parents spent a few years like I don't know, they had they had their dominoes phase where all of a sudden my parents discovered Mexican train and one yep. other way to play dominoes. And every time we went over like let's play cards, like no oh, no, let's play dominoes and I preferred cards. Yep. But that didn't last. They 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 ended up going back to cards. Yeah, well, I mean it's very it's also I mean you also you've also got um uh, some of the the, the Chinese uh, mahjong plays, yep. uh, you know, and, and things like that. It's, it does seem there do, definitely are some cultural roots to certain of these games. Uh, I believe dominoes, and and I, I'm speaking without any actual data right in front of me, but I believe <laughs> there is a strong uh, Hispanic uh, yes. background between uh, in dominoes. Yeah, uh, I was going to say that that should be down south. I'm pretty sure that came yeah. up from Mexico. So, from what I understand. Which probably goes back to Spain would be my guess. Impossible. All right. A couple of comments from our Discord channel earlier today. So Math Guy Dave pointed out, all I ever played was Spades and Hearts with the math team. But again, he played Spades and Hearts with the math team. Oh, and Bridge, instead of trigger, in, 
trigonometry class. Now, bridge is a game I didn't even bother to try to learn to play. Yeah, never. And then I, I De Burke is known for euchre, but I've never played. I'm assuming De Burke is a school. Dubuque. I, Dubuque. 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 Okay. Or an area I don't actually know Dubuque. Sorry, Math Gay Dave. That's probably where Math Gay Dave's from. I feel feel bad here. Now, his argument, and I think this may be true, and we kind of alluded this to a bit, and I think it's worth talking about, is in his opinion, phones have killed card games. That's why, as I've said before, many of my students don't know the suits anymore. So Math Guy Dave is a teacher, and his kids don't even know hearts, spades, clubs, diamonds, which to me just sounds weird. Like, I'm sure, like, Roger trying to teach people to play his euchre-based ice game, and he's like... Bye bye, Meeple. <laughs> <laughs> like Roger trying to teach people to play his, his euchre based dice game, or and they're like, "What? What's a trick? And what? What's that?" But yeah, people don't even know the the four suits. Which man, like I guess it, it probably happens, but it's, no. I mean, you know, times change. I mean, I I still I still think of it as a pound sign and not a hashtag. Um, yeah. You know, there there's there's things like that um, where where it's just you know that the things have have changed, and I mean, you know, a heart's a heart, but uh, what's you know what is a spade what's a, a spade what's a spade in a club right they don't uh yep. those don't have any real physical connection to us anymore so so jeff say he doesn't see phones killing cards i still think cards died before phones became common yeah and i well i think i think standard playing cards died before phones became common but again there was a drift towards some other the collectible uh, card collectibles game? but also we were getting into some some non-phone games i mean there were digital games in you know handheld games out there oh, yeah yeah things the like game tamagotchi the... even um, you know, yeah. little little digital games uh that were that you could pull out of your pocket and play that didn't require you know the handling and sorting and dealing with of cards yep. well here's a theory then I wonder if we only played cards because it was the only thing we had to do. We were bored and it was some way to pass time. And now there's a lot more options. You had your Tamagotchis, yeah. you had your, your Game Boy, you had whatever, your, your, your phone eventually. I think that might just be it is, is they were presented with more options than cards. And you're like, wow, I can do something other than play a Euchre for the thousandth time. Yeah, no, I think there's also a definitely, um, you know, to play a game of Euchre, you need to have four people to sit down mm. or, you know, you could do open hands and things like that. But basically you needed four people to sit down and you needed to kind of at least sort of like at least one other one of them. Uh, whereas, you know, with a, a, a little video game, maybe you only needed one other person or maybe just yourself. Um, it wasn't as hard to get things going. Uh, and, you know, Magic, you only need one other player to sit down and get a game of magic games. And sometimes, you know, at high school is a pain. Sometimes it can be hard to find three other people you want to deal Fair. with, uh, especially on a regular ongoing basis. So. All right. In the chat, what do you think? Do you think that, that we kind of cover things well enough? Yeah. I mean, there's a few other we're games they got the into place. there and, and, uh, but, uh, all over the place, but they, but I think definitely, uh, you know, Pennywise is agreeing, you know, portable video games uh, doesn't necessarily need to be a phone, but video games in various forms have slowly uh, invaded some of our time mm. that would have been play, used to play those card games in the past. So kind of to summarize, I think, trying to catch from we were all over the place here. Uh, for one, it was just a distraction. Now there are more distractions out there. It is definitely seems that Euchre in particular is definitely regional. Uh, something that's definitely in Ontario and the, the Midwest is definitely where it comes from and where it's known from, especially in Michigan. So we have confirmed that as far as like with, with as much accuracy as we have, um, we've confirmed that. Um, and that, yes, it's people are playing it less and less as time goes on. And, and I might get to the point where it dies off. Uh, that if especially if kids these days don't know what a heart, spade, club and diamond are. And to be honest, I don't know if my kids do. I actually don't know either way because it, to me, um, I tend to enjoy games with a bit of story and a bit of background to them, kind of like Jeff in the chat room there. So I'm more likely to grab a thematic trick taking game or a thematic card game than one that's uh, just using a standard deck of cards. And I, there's just something, I don't know. It's, it's that, that it's superiority feeling isn't the word for it, but just like uh, those seem like simple games. I'd rather play something with a bit more meat to it, right? Just cause, but I think it's just a bias because that's what I grew up with. So yeah. because I grew up with it, I feel that it's simple just because I was able to play it as a kid, which isn't necessarily true. Like, like people wouldn't still be playing Euchre if there wasn't enough depth to that game to keep people interested for 80 years of their life. Yep. 
And so I um, pointed out in the lobby that what we one thing we haven't done here is we haven't actually explained what a trick taking game is. Well, we'll leave that for people to discover on their own. No. <laughs> <laughs> so a trick taking game is a card game where or not a necessarily card uh, domino. You can have dominoes trick taking games as well. But a, a game in which you play a, a set number of hands of uh, of whatever you're playing with uh, and you are the winner takes a collection from each hand uh, and generally, you know, again, generally take the, uh, the one with the most who has taken the most uh, or gained the most points from taking, taking those tricks wins. So uh, the trick is, is taking the, the victory of each hand. The other thing that is 99% common in almost every trick taking game, if not all of them is you have multiple suits of your cards or multiple colors, and usually one suit is dominant in a way. Um, that's usually called the trump suit. And part of it is when you lead a card, so the first card played sets the suit for that round, and everyone else has to follow. And follow that suit, play the same suit. If you can't follow that suit, you can throw off, so you can throw a different suit. Whereas the trump, if you throw the trump off, it will take the suit. It would win the suit, even if it's not the highest number or highest card. That's a, a huge part of trick taking. So it's the combination of everyone plays a card and the highest card takes that trick. So they get the points or whatever. Um, the, no, in some trick taking games, you don't want to take tricks, but it's the, the well, highest trick, value. Trick avoidance take games and trick taking games are sort of the. Yeah. Uh, to me, the they're the same game. thing. They're still trick taking. It's just you're forcing someone else to take the trick instead of you. And good trick-taking games, in my opinion, combine both. Um, and that's why I like hearts, is you can shoot the moon. Where you lose points for taking hearts, but if you get all of them, you get bonus points. I love that aspect of trick-taking. But the general thing is you're going to each play one card. The first card led, everyone has to follow that suit. If you don't, ha and you have to follow, and if you don't have that suit, you can throw off. When you throw off, if you throw a trump, it'll take a suit. And you can lead trump and still the highest number will take it. That's a generic thing. Now, that's way easier to teach in person. It's, it's a little hard to describe, but if I had a deck of cards, I can show it to you in seconds. Yeah. Like it's, it's really simple to teach the basic premise of trick taking. And as I said, we just did this the other day, actually. We, we just taught my oldest daughter played her first trick taking game, one of the games we're going to review later tonight, and she was able to pick it up really quick. Now, the strategy is where she had a hard time of what, when do I want to trick a trick? When do I want to play Trump? When do I not? And while that's the stuff people have been trying to perfect in games like Euchre for a hundred or more, well, more, way more than a hundred years. Yeah, and if you if you want to understand just how difficult it is, just check Wikipedia for trick taking games and you'll see that there is a whole lot to it. It's not just as yeah. simple as, you know, you, you play the cards and, and somebody wins and moves on. There's 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 a lot of depth it's variant. to the yeah. the concept of trick-taking games so we're going to take a look at uh some of those yeah so i think we covered everything pretty well um i think we're good to go so what we're going to do now is we're going to move on to modern trick-taking games i personally still recommend playing the originals i they like say i love sp spades and hearts are my two favorite hearts again the neat trick in hearts is uh, the neat trick uh the neat thing in hearts is that the the red the hearts are worth negative points but if you get all of them, you get bonus points. That's that's a really rough overview. There's also something to do with spades and whatever. The, 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 it matter as well in jacks and stuff. But anyway, the other one is spades. And what I like in spades is you have to bid how many tricks you're going to take every round. So it's a matter of you get your hand, you look at your hand and go, okay, with these cards, I'm going to take seven out of the 13 tricks. And you get points for getting it right, and you lose points for getting it wrong. And those are my two favorites. Now, there are others, but those are the two I like the most. So what we're going to do now is move past the games that have been around for hundreds of years and move into some modern trick-taking games, games that take those original concepts of Euchre, Spades, Hearts, and do new things with them and take them to new places. As usual, this list is in no specific order, and at the end we'll have a few honorable mentions. All right, number one, this is, I say it's in no order, but this is probably still the top of the list, I got to say, is The Fox in the Forest. This is a two-player only trick-taking game we mentioned a number of times on the show. I'm not going to repeat everything we said in the past, but as noted before, the biggest thing with this game is it shocked me that it works because it's two players only. Like I, growing up, always think of trick-taking games as four players, either four players exactly or two teams of two. Never as something that would work with only two players. And the Fox in the Forest proved me wrong completely. Yeah, and we've talked about this uh, plenty of times in the show of late, so we'll move on. But again, this was the Fox in the Forest. 
And then, of course, the follow up would be the fact that while I was surprised the Fox in the Forest worked, I was even more surprised by the follow up game, the Fox in the Forest duet. This took the original trick taking game and made it a cooperative game. Like, this is the first cooperative two player game I've discovered that works this well. It is a fantastic two player experience. And again, how does trick taking game work cooperative and they manage to do it? This has become one of our go to date night games for Deanna and I. When we're, when it's just the two of us, it takes up a little small footprint that just a board in the cards. And man, is it good. The only problem is you play in silence. So, depending on what you want from your date night game, you may not want it for that if you want to socialize while playing. Yeah, the, the lack of talking can be uh, good or bad, again, depending on relationships and how the rest of the week went. But either way, that is Fox in the Forest duet. Next, I have Diamonds. Now, again, I just mentioned this earlier. My two favorite trick-taking games are Hearts and Spades. There is another one called Clubs that I actually never played. I still love Hearts and Spades, and I thought it was fascinating that it's in my lifetime, like recently, that someone invented diamonds that for years went by that no one had made a game based on the diamonds suit of cards. This is published by Stronghold Games and is the, the logical follow-up to Hearts, Spades, and Clubs. What Diamonds does that I like, for one, is it breaks that four-player mold right away. You can play six players. I don't know, at the time, I didn't know any other big player count trick-taking games so that was great then it has some neat hidden information mechanics where you have this little vault and you're holding how many gems you've collected and then it also has some really neat mechanics for playing off suit so if you play off suit with different cards different things happen where you're stealing gems and moving them to vaults and stuff like that it's way more fiddly than most traditional card games and it does require more than a standard deck of cards but i think this is a great next step so for people who like hearts and spades to give them more of a almost a euro experience of like moving around resources while you're playing i think this is a good next step for a trick taking game right and so uh, unlike uh, you know a betting trick uh, game this is similar but it's a a, a in-game resource rather than yes. having to worry about uh, anting up and leaving without your wallet at the end of the night and that is and trust me if you wanted to play for money it's really easy each gem's a buck or five bucks or a penny and that was diamonds all right, next is Wizard. This is the hobby card game that's closest to playing a standard trick card. Trick, yeah. Wizard is a hobby card game that is closest to playing a trick-taking game with a standard deck. Now, it does have a special deck. It's a little bit different, but this is probably the most approachable game on the list for playing with people who are hardcore standard card game fans. This is the one that if my parents were open to playing a new card game, I would break this one out. This is a bidding game similar to spades where you're going to bid for how many tricks you're going to take. But the brilliant thing wizard does is you actually start off with one card. So you do a one card hand and the first card, is, are you going to take the trick or not? Yes or no. And then you have a two card hand. You can take one tricks, two tricks or none. Then it's a three card hand, then a four card hand up to, I think the max is 13 or 18. And I can't remember what, and then you get points for being right. You lose points for being wrong. I think that is a fantastic. It is my favorite bidding version for bidding on your tricks and why is it called wizard uh there is like one of the suits or like there's a wizard or a joker i to be honest i don't remember it's been a long time since <laughs> i played wizard uh first time i played wizard was at a great canadian board game blitz so it, it's and i was really impressed and i'm like okay i need to get a wizard deck now all right well that was wizard uh next is one this is a lesser known this is the hidden gem on our list this is black spy this is for fans of hearts. If you want to, you, you have someone who's a hardcore fan of hearts, pick this one out. This is an evolution of hearts. It's played with a uh, played using pretty much standard trick taking rules. But the thing is only the black cards are worth points with the two black spy cards being worth the most. This is another one that's just that little bit different from a traditional game to make it a little more interesting and throwing just a little bit of a theme on there. But I think it's another one that's great as a next step for traditional card gamers. All right, and that is Black Spy. Talking about throwing a theme on a game, Goris Maximus splatters it all over the place. Uh, the highlight of this gladiatorial combat-based trick-taking game is two things, I would say. First off, you can play a huge number of people. Like, I think it goes up to eight players. Eight players for a trick-taking game is phenomenal in a way because it's great for those nights where you want everyone to play at the same table together instead of splitting off into two groups of four. Then it's the fact that the trump can change mid-hand by playing a similar card, same number as the person beside you. 
Added to that is a really unique point-based system uh, of numbers on the various cards that include some negative point values. So this is one of the ones where you're going to take a trick and then you're going to add up how much it's worth. And you could score negative points because some of the cards are punitive. Now, I think that is a really fascinating way where the, I think I've got a great trick and then someone throws that bad card in there. Like it's a great example to me of a modern trick-taking game where it uses that basic mechanics and lever- layers on new things to keep it fresh. Just watch for that not-so-kid-friendly art. Right, and they do have a uh, follow-up coming out that has got a uh, a non, or mm-hmm. that is a kid-friendly uh, sea change is their follow-up that has a much more family-friendly art set. But we were talking about Gorus Maximus, which is just a fantastic game. Yeah, it's it's really solid. All right, the last game I've got on the list tonight, you can't quite get yet. This is launching on Kickstarter later this month. And I seriously, if you are a fan of trick taking games, watch for this one. Um, I don't really promote Kickstarters all that often. No, I'm not being paid to promote this Kickstarter, but I think it's going to be worth backing. And that's Macaron. We're going to be doing a full review of this trick taking game later in the show. And what I will say here that the neat new thing it does is a voting system to determine Trump and a system that makes one of the suits unfavorable every turn. They call this the allergen suit. And what happens is if you get any allergens in with your cards, they're worth no points that round. And that was Macaron. All right, up next, we are going to move on to three honorable mentions. Now, uh, people who joined us for the pre-show live on Twitch night already got a little spoiler on this one. The number one game on my honorable mentions today is Tichu. Uh, I think that's how it's pronounced, T-I-C-H-U. This is the game that when I did research for this episode was at the top or near the top of every top trick-taking game list out there for hobby board games. That technically spades, euchre, and hearts tended to be on the top when you're looking at traditional card games. I figure this probably belongs on the main list, like for the amount of people that seem to love this game, except I've never actually gotten a chance to play it. So if anyone local, and I know we have some people in the chatter from Windsor, I have a copy of Tichu. I would love to try it. Earlier today, we just checked. It's not on Board Game Arena. I would love to give this one a try to see what the fuss is about. Tichu, T-I-C-H-U. Everyone seems to love this. Haven't had a chance to play it myself. It is ranked 160th overall on Board Game Geek. So that's pretty big. Yeah, and it's been out since 1991. I mean, it's it's ah. it's a classic. And that was Teach You. Next is Trick of the Rails. Now I threw this one on the list because it's the one I'm most curious about. Out of all the trick taking games I looked over in the last three days doing research for this episode, this supposedly combines an 18xx style portfolio management your whole stock trading and buying train routes with trade taking. And I got to say that fascinates me. Like this is one of the heaviest weighted trick taking games out there. And no, it's not a four. It's like a 2.75, but for a trick taking game that's really high. And I am really curious to try a heavy trick taking game. I want to know what they could do with this one. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if uh, 2.3 really counts as heavy, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll see. So that that is, is, compare that to Euchre and Spades, and that, that's what I mean by heavy. That is Trick of the Rails. All right, the final one is the one our chat room's been yelling at us since we finished the, uh, the main list, and that is The Crew, The Quest for Planet Nine. Uh, this is what I would consider the new hotness in trick-taking. Everyone is talking about this cooperative trick-taking game. Um, after playing Fox in the Forest duet, I'm super hyped to see someone else do a cooperative trick-taking game and see what they do with it. Um, this one even has a campaign element where you go through progressively harder missions and the base box comes with 50 missions and they've already talked about more coming. This sounds fantastic, but I don't have a copy. I haven't had a chance to play it. This is one I think I probably would have seen at the local game store had things not been as messed up as they are this year. And unfortunately, I just don't have a contact to get a review copy of this one. But I got to say the crew looks fantastic. It probably belongs on the main list. But again, I haven't played it myself. And I mean, we're talking about an 8.0 rating with 9,000 yeah. ratings, 58th overall in BGG and number three in family games. Wow. That's, that's big. That's that the is crew, big. the quest for planet nine released 2019 
uh, and Cosmos actually is one of the publishers. Sure, on that. Cosmos, yes. You know what? I was supposed to get a copy of that. But Unfortunately, Cosmos is no longer shipping to Canada, so we will not be reviewing any more Cosmos games. So yes, that is one I asked for. I knew I asked someone for that one. Yeah, it looks fantastic. I, I got to say, it looks great. Uh, that one is on Board Game Arena, so we probably should sit down and try yeah. it at some point. Absolutely. But card games, like, oh, even more so, <laughs> I feel like I want the cards in my hands. But fair enough. Well, that's it for our discussion on trick-taking games. We're going to head over to the lobby now and see if anyone in our chat room has any other games to add that we missed. All right, so we have everyone telling us to check out. We got like five different people telling us to check out the crew. The, yep. the, the, the crew. So we're going to have to check out the crew one way or another. Uh, Jeff's even offered to lend it to us, so that might be cool. Um, what I will ask Jeff is to play well two players, because that I'm assuming if Jeff has it, it probably plays well two players. But that is the biggest uh, thing I would be worried about. Community now, we says have two five, else? best at four. Best at four, yeah. So that's a little rough. Though we do have extended family to play with. It is. I mean, it's not like it's not recommended at five, two. It's just best at well pennywise is saying not a fan at two so oh, okay. sounds like we may need more so again i have the chat open but i haven't been watching it what do we have that people have recommended that we missed uh, i did see some I comments think... mentioning what they thought of what we talked about mm. indulgence from restoration games that is one i've seen the cover of and that's all i know i didn't even know that was a trick-taking game uh jeff sue strongly recommends whist now this is another classic though so uh, he's saying most trick-taking games today are just whist with different scoring methods, different numbers of hands, and different ways to determine trump. So uh, Indulgence is a re-implementation of Coup d'Etat or Dragon oh, Masters. Oh, that was one of my parents' favorite games. I have a copy of Coup d'Etat downstairs. So that's what Indulgence is, is a re-implementation of oh, that. very cool. You know what? I, I got that. My parents used to play Coup d'Etat two to three times a year with a local family. They would play games of Coup d'Etat, and then they would play a full round of Mahjong. And I got my dad's copy and I haven't had a chance to actually play it. It's been downstairs. It's on the pile of shame. So yeah, I would actually like to try coup d'etat and it's cool to know that's back. Like my parents were huge fans of coup d'etat. Right. Uh, Rook, I know of, uh, again, I know of it because I share deals on it on Amazon all the time. Well, and, and I mean, Rook, it. Rook is a hundred years old. <laughs> yeah, Rook's, Rook again is probably not a modern. Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure there are game. modern printings of it, but I mean that, yeah, that that's, uh, that's 1900s, <laughs> early 1900s. I wonder how, I wonder if restoration improved it much or if it's, if it's close to the original. Okay. Now I, now I'm tempted. I got I'm going to have to break out my parents' copy of coup d'etat and get that played sooner rather than later. Later. Crew plays okay with two, but with a variant. So there you go. So that, that's another thing that's going to keep us away from the crew right now someday we will be able to gather again and we will play the crew well and, and you know what maybe tomorrow uh we may our our, our normal thursday night plans may get uh, goofed up so maybe we could try a three-player on bga and yeah if that uh if that falls through so that's all i'm seeing from the chat right now are you ready to move on uh, i think so i think we caught most of it while we were doing the actual discussion thank you again everyone who took part tonight that was a, a fantastic amount of interaction as always if you've got a game or game night question for us head over to the website click on ask the bellhop or email us questions at tabletopbellhop.com <laughs>